always true. We ask the question, what is needed in the world? Is that going to be? A few years ago, Yuval Noah Harari's job description was relatively simple. A professor at Jerusalem's Hebrew University specializing in medieval history. A decision to broaden his canvas led to a non-fiction publishing phenomenon and his elevation to one of the world's best-known public intellectuals. It came in the form of Sapiens, Harari's sweeping, energizing history of our species from its birth to the present day, charting the effects of farming, technology and culture in the formation of what he argues is now one global civilization. It won huge praise and huge sales, eight million and counting. Next was Homo Deus, an exploration of how the confluence of big data, artificial intelligence and biotech could radically alter and divide society and humanity, perhaps ending our species altogether. Harari himself tries to stay at one remove from the data revolution. He meditates two hours a day. He doesn't own a smartphone. Now comes a collation of his recent work, essays, talks, responses to readers, brought together as 21 lessons for the 21st century. Although the lessons often read more as observations of trends that aren't likely to end well for Homo sapiens. I spoke with Professor Harari recently in Tel Aviv. Here's the first part of our conversation. Yuval Noah Harari, thank you very much for talking to Al Jazeera. It's my pleasure. Um, you talk a lot, uh, especially recently, about the dizzying pace of change in the world and the accelerating nature of that change and whether human beings are really equipped to, to deal with it. Uh, your own life has gone through a huge amount of change in the last few yeah. years. Um, how are you dealing with it and, and what's it been like? Well, it has been quite, quite a dizzying change, as you say. Um, like a couple of years ago, I was just an anonymous professor in Jerusalem specializing in medieval military history. Uh, things like the Crusades and the Hundred Years' War. And here I am now talking about cyborgs and artificial intelligence to uh, the leaders of the world and the technological community. So it's a very big change. Um, I think I'm, I'm coping well. <laughs> um, and, and so what is your job description now? I mean, as you say, your, your professional background is as a historian. Um, you, were doing, you were doing that uh, to obviously a good deal of professional satisfaction and acclaim, mm -hmm. but not with a kind of huge public profile, not with a huge public impact that you have now. So what, how do you see your role now and what are the things that, that you want to think about and talk about given the, 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 amount, the number of people that, that listen to you and read you now? Well, I still see myself as a historian. I don't think that historians are specialists in the past. Historians are specialists in change, in how things change. And they learn the nature of change by looking at the past. But, you know, the past is gone. Everybody who lived in the past is dead. Uh, nobody really cares about kings who lived thousands of years ago and battles that ended centuries ago. The real question is what is happening right now? What can we learn from the past about the future changes and what we should be doing and thinking today? And I see my job as trying to bring more clarity uh, to the public discussion. Because what I see today in the world is that um, people are overwhelmed by information, by misinformation, by distraction. And they don't realize often what are the most important challenges and changes that we are facing. I mean, there is a fair bit of overlap uh, among your three books so far, but broadly the first was about the, the history of, uh, of, of Homo sapiens and mm -hmm. how we got to this point. The second it was a you know, pretty long look into the future of, of our species. Uh, this current book seems to be more urgent somehow, that yeah. you, you're really trying to address uh, the, the main challenges and threats that we face now, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's... Um Again, the first book was about the past, the second about the future, but if you really learn anything from observing the long-term past and history of humankind, it must manifest itself in how you behave and what decisions you take in the present moment. So this is why the, the, the current book is about what is happening right now, about immigration and terrorism and climate change and the rise of nationalism and things like that. And so what are, in your view, the, the key challenges and, and threats that, that we face right now and, and, and going forward? Well, there are three big 
challenges facing humankind in the 21st century, they are nuclear war, climate change, and technological disruption, especially the rise of artificial intelligence and bioengineering. This will change the world more than anything else. Uh, nuclear war and climate change, hopefully we can prevent them from happening. So these are changes we try to avoid. But technological disruption, again, especially artificial intelligence and bioengineering, this is bound to happen. We still have some choice about what kind of impact AI and bioengineering will have on the world, but they will change the world, maybe more than anything that happened previously in the history. And these are the main challenges. Anything else is a distraction. So if, if we look at big data and AI and, uh, and bioengineering, the confluence of those, of those things, you say that we have some choice as to how, uh, how we respond and how we try and, uh, and tailor their, their mm -hmm. effect. But reading your book, you seem to be pretty definitive about where this is going. Um, what do you think is going to happen and what is going to be the, the impact on, on all of us? Well, some things are definitely going to happen. For example, uh, computers and robots replacing more and more human jobs. But what will be the consequence of that? Will this create an extremely unequal society in which a tiny elite uh, controls all the economy and makes all the profits, whereas most humans become part of some kind of useless class? This is not inevitable. This is up to us. Similarly, the combination of AI and biotechnology means that we are very close to the point when you can hack human beings. There is a lot of talk about hacking computers and emails and bank accounts, but actually we are entering into the era of hacking humans. And I would say the most important fact anybody who is alive today needs to know about the 21st century is that we are becoming hackable animals. This is the most important thing. Hackable, but what, sorry, hackable how? How, how? how are we becoming hackable? Are we talking about what we read and, uh, and what we're told, or are we talking about something deeper? It starts on the surface. It starts, and this is what we already see today, it starts by uh, having corporations and governments uh, amass enormous amounts of data about where we go and what we search online and what we buy and things like that. But this is all surface and, and outside, how we behave in the world. The big watershed, the big change will come once it starts penetrating inside, inside your body. Once you can start monitoring and surveying what is happening inside your body, inside your brain, then you can really hack human beings. And this, we are very close to it. Already a lot of people go about with you know, Fitbits that constantly measure their heart rate, their blood pressure. You cross that with what you buy and what you search online, or what you read, or what, or what you watch on television. So you, you, you watch a movie, and at the same time, Netflix can know what is happening to your, to your heart rate or to your brain activity. You, this is going inside the human body. When you combine our increasing understanding of biology, and especially brain science, with the enormous computing power that machine learning and AI is giving us, what you get from that combination is the ability to hack humans, which means to predict their choices, to understand their feelings, to manipulate them, and also uh, to replace them. If you can hack something, you can also replace it. So this is the, the, the big issue. It, it's not, it won't happen in a year or two, but in 10, 20, 30 years, we are likely to reach a point when an external system knows you better than you know yourself. It will never know you perfectly. There is nothing perfect in the world. There is no such thing as perfect knowledge. Amazon or the government will never know you 100%, but it doesn't need to. It just needs to know you better than you know yourself. And this is not very difficult because most people don't know themselves very well. A lot, you're talking there about machine learning and, and AI. A lot of the talk about the concerns of, for the future with, with AI taking an ever bigger role is that it could itself develop consciousness, that it could mm. start to develop different goals from, from its originators mm -hmm. and thereby become a threat to humanity. You seem a bit more sanguine about 
that aspect aspect of it. Why? Yeah, I think you know, the, the big dangers are to the job market. The big danger is that AI will serve to uh, empower a small number of people and create a digital dictatorship. I don't think. It's not impossible, but I think it's highly unlikely that in the near or even medium future, AI will gain consciousness and uh, uh, start having feelings and desires of its own and start killing people because of that. Or, or This is science fiction. I think I really like science fiction, but I think the worst service that science fiction has done over the last few years is to distract people from the real dangers of AI and focus them on unrealistic scenarios. Uh, there is absolutely no indication that AI and computers are anywhere on the road to becoming conscious. Uh, there is a big confusion, both in the scientific community, but especially in science fiction, between intelligence and consciousness. People think that artificial intelligence also implies artificial consciousness. But they are two completely different things. Intelligence is the ability to solve problems. Consciousness is the ability to feel things like pain and pleasure and love and hate. Now, in humans and other mammals, like dogs or chimpanzees, it's true that consciousness and intelligence go together. We solve problems by having feelings. But computers work in a completely different way. Over the last decades, computers have become extremely intelligent, but they, are, they have no consciousness. And this is likely to continue. Just like, you know, uh, airplanes fly far faster than birds without ever developing feathers. So computers are likely to become far more intelligent than humans without ever developing consciousness. Uh, my personal impression is that all these science fiction movies about robots becoming conscious and then starting to kill people and things like that, these are not about humans being afraid of intelligent robots. Actually, these movies are about men being afraid of intelligent women. Because if you look carefully, you will see that in almost all cases, the scientist who develops the robot is, men, is a man, and the robot is female, like in Westworld or in Ex Machina. And these movies are actually about feminism, about this male fear that, hey, we have created this thing, and, and, and now it's becoming more intelligent and more powerful than us. So it's, 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 it's a big distraction for the public. I mean, there is that, the famous thought experiment about the... Um the AI, which has just given one instruction to create paper clips, and yeah. it destroys everything, the entire mm -hmm. planet, by churning through all matter until everything is, mm -hmm. is paper clips. That doesn't need to be a, a conscious being in order to have a devastating effect. That's true. You don't need that. That is, that is, that is a more. I mean, these kinds of problems that you give an AI a particular purpose, and you don't really think through what the consequences will be. Uh, this is already happening. If you look at the way that, that algorithms shape the public discourse and are responsible for the, for the spread of fake news, then this problem is not science fiction, it's a reality. You give the algorithm of the uh, 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 social network the instruction, maximize traffic on my website. This is the instruction. And then the algorithm discovers, without any consciousness, just by analyzing data, that if you push up um, fantastic stories about all kinds of ridiculous things that never happened that make people angry or make people excited, this draws a lot of attention. So nobody gave the algorithm the instruction, spread fake news. But this is what the algorithm ends up doing in, in the service of the goal it was given, which is to maximize uh, traffic on the website. Just the humans who gave the algorithm this goal, maximize traffic, they did not take into account that the best way, or one of the best ways to maximize traffic is to make people angry and to make people fearful by spreading fake news. But this is the result. Well, to talk about fake news more, more later on, but just on, on the idea that we stand uh, on at, at a place where we may soon become sort of enthralled to these sort of faceless, conscienceless beings. To some extent, haven't we lived in that world for a while? I mean, there is a thing called a corporation, mm. which has emerged without any uh, 
authorship other than originally to, to make money for, for its founders. Yes. And suddenly, after a, a few decades, they take on a, an essence of their own, and, and suddenly we have human beings serving these corporations. Obviously, the, at the top, they make money from it. But they don't have any purpose, but they do grow, and they, they take over more and more of, of the world if they're successful. Mm -hmm. um, how is that different in order from what could happen with vastly powerful AIs serving these corporations in many, in many well, respects? The big difference is that corporations and also, also nations, which is, are also imaginary entities, they still need humans to make all the important decisions. Uh, but now with the development of AI, more and more the, the important decisions will not be made by any human being. They will be made by an algorithm. You may still want to keep a human being at the top as the CEO of the corporation or the president of the country, if not for any other reasons than just for the sake of appearance. But the actual decisions will not be taken by the CEO or by the president. Uh, the AI will present some choices and the president will choose, okay, let's do this. But the choices are shaped by the way that the AI understands reality. If you take something like the financial system, already today, the vast majority of people are incapable of understanding the financial system. It's far too complicated. And with the advance of AI, it is likely to go beyond the ability of any human being to understand it. AI will work so fast with so much data, it will create financial uh, tools and financial systems which are far beyond human understanding. And then when you need to make a big financial decision for the corporation or for the country, no human is able to really understand what the options are. It's too complicated. So think about the situation, not in a thousand years, but in 50 years or 30 years, when the key financial decisions are taken by an algorithm and no human being is able to understand why the algorithm chose this and not that. If this sounds, again, science fiction impossible, just consider that this is already happening on a lower level, even today, in many places around the world, when you apply for a loan, you go to the bank and you apply for a loan, your application is not being processed by any human being. It is processed by a big data algorithm that goes over more and more data about you, not just financial data, but even your Facebook profile or your Twitter account. And based on enormous amounts of data, the algorithm decides whether to give you a loan or not. And when you go, you go to the bank to say that the algorithm said no, don't give this person a, a loan, he's unreliable, I, I, I looked at his Facebook feed, he seems to be an unreliable person, don't give him a loan, he will never return it. And the bank says no. And you go to the bank and you say, why not? What's wrong with me? And the bank says, we don't know. The algorithm said no. And we've learned by experience that if we follow the advice of our algorithm, then we make a lot of money because people return the loan. If we think we are smarter than the algorithm, then we make mistakes. And on an even lower level, on the individual level, just look at how people have outsourced uh, decision about you know, navigating your way around the city. You need to go from point A to point B. Previously, you rely on your own personal knowledge and gut instincts. Over the last few years, many people have learned that it's better to trust the Google Maps algorithm. You reach an intersection, your gut feeling tells you turn right, but Google says, no, 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 turn left, it's better. You say, what does Google know? They are stupid, I'll, I'll, I'll follow my instincts, and you're stuck in traffic, and you're late. Next time you know, better listen to the algorithm. And within a year or two, you lose the ability to navigate space by yourself, because it's basically like a muscle. If you don't use it, you lose it. So what's happening now with things like finding your way around the city, in 50 years, it could happen to finding the country's way around the financial markets. You talk um, about free will, ab about it being illusory, uh, mm -hmm. the self to a greater or lesser extent being illusory as, as well. You know, that we are a, a mass of um, neurons and synapses and biochemicals and 
the actions of external environmental uh, actors on those processes, all giving us this, this feeling of ourselves which isn't necessarily true, uh, that, that there is some sort of captain of the ship at the, at the helm. That being the case, why is it so much more of a threat that uh, another factor could enter into this system, that factor being AI and these big, big data machines? Well, it's a question of it's not necessarily bad. In many cases, it's wonderful. If you think about healthcare, then an AI system that constantly monitors your body can give you the best healthcare in history. At present, say, if you have cancer, usually you discover it when the cancer already spread. And it's very difficult and costly and painful to take care of it. But with an AI system that monitors your body 24 hours a day, it's very likely that we could discover cancer when it's just beginning. And it's very easy and cheap uh, to cure it. So there are many uh, benefits. Or to give another example, um, if you think about, again, about the road, car accidents, traffic accidents. Today, every year, 1.25 million people are killed in traffic accidents around the world. That's twice the number of people who die from violence, from war, crime, and terrorism put together. And the vast majority of traffic accidents are because of human error. If you replace human drivers with self-driving vehicles and algorithms, you won't reduce traffic accidents to zero, but it is likely that at least a million lives will be saved every year. That's wonderful. Um, so I'm not against uh, giving more authority to AI. The question is, who is uh, the master or who, who, the AI, who does it serve? Does it serve a small elite of big corporations? Does it serve dictatorial governments or does it serve me? Uh, the same technology can be used in very different ways. You can use AI to create a total surveillance regime of the government controlling the population, and you can reverse the order and use AI for the citizens to survey the government and make sure there is no corruption. It can go both ways. Oh, the same oh, oh, with myself. At present, most of these big data al algorithms, they hack me in the service of some corporation or government. They get to know my weaknesses so that they can capture my attention and sell me products or sell me politicians or make me waste hours uh, uh, watching funny cat videos online, just so there is more traffic on, on the web page. But you can take the same technology and again reverse the order and build an AI protector, an AI sidekick uh, that knows my own weaknesses and defends me against these manipulations. I mean, the key fact is to realize that most of the decisions I make, this is not free will. This is my biochemical system, which is hackable. And once you realize it, you realize that just as people can hack my computer, so I have an antivirus protecting my computer, people can hack my brain also, and they are doing it. It's much more valuable than my computer. If I have an antivirus program for my computer, why don't I, don't I have one for my brain? And we, can, we, we don't do it at, pres at present, but there are billions to be made from creating an antivirus for, for the brain, which, for example, in, in a, like, to give a simple, a simple uh, example of how, how it works, you surf the, the web, and suddenly something pops up and tries to capture your imagination, your attention, because it knows your weaknesses that, I don't know, you like cats and you like funny cat videos, so it, it, it brings up this funny cat video, and you're just about to be tempted, but then your AI sidekick kicks in and says, ah, somebody is trying to hack you. Somebody is trying to manipulate you. It blocks this uh, invasion. And you know, just as you get these messages from your computer that, oh, I just detected a, a, a Trojan horse, or I just detected a worm and, and got rid of it, so it will inform you, oh, you, somebody just tried to hack you, and I saved you. So the AI can serve you. I'd buy one of those, I think. Yeah, it sounds like a good <laughs> idea. On the next episode of Talk to Al Jazeera, we continue our conversation 
on the future of mankind with historian and author Yuval Noah Harari. Always. We ask the question. A few years ago, Yuval Noah Harari's job description was relatively simple a professor at Jerusalem's Hebrew University specializing in medieval history. A decision to broaden his canvas led to a non fiction publishing phenomenon and his elevation to one of the world's best known public intellectuals. It came in the form of Sapiens, Harari's sweeping, energizing history of our species from its birth to the present day, charting the effects of farming, technology and culture in the formation of what he argues is now one global civilization. It won huge praise and huge sales, eight million and counting. Next was Homo Deus, an exploration of how the confluence of big data, artificial intelligence and biotech could radically alter and divide society and humanity perhaps ending our species altogether. Harari himself tries to stay at one remove from the data revolution. He meditates two hours a day. He doesn't own a smartphone. Now comes a collation of his recent work, essays, talks, responses to readers, brought together as 21 lessons for the 21st century. Although the lessons often read more as observations of trends that aren't likely to end well for Homo sapiens. I spoke with Professor Harari recently in Tel Aviv. Here's the second part of our conversation. Um, you are talking about um, how this is a, a book for, for right now. Obviously, the politics of right now are more roiled than they've been for a while. So let's mm -hmm. talk about some of the, the, the major ones going on at the moment. Brexit, you talk about the possibility, even likelihood, of Brexit unraveling the United Kingdom, unraveling mm -hmm. the European Union. Yeah. How, how does it unravel from this point? Uh, as people lose faith in the ability to cooperate with others, with other countries, they become much more self-centered. Then everybody puts their interests first, and it becomes more in, harder and harder to cooperate. If you think that down the road we will see greater and greater cooperation, then you're more willing in the present moment to compromise your immediate interests. Because you say, okay, in the long run, we are all in this together. But if you think, no, in the long run, everybody's going their separate ways, then I must protect my interests right now. And this, you know, it's, it's a vicious circle. It's a self-fulfilling prophecy. Then the system immediately or very quickly unravels. Now, I don't think there is anything inherently wrong with Brexit, with, say, Britain wanting to be independent from the EU. The problem is really one of timing, that at this moment in history, humankind is facing three big problems, uh, nuclear war, climate change, and technological disruption. To s all of these are global problems. They have no national solutions. You cannot uh, uh, prevent climate change on a national basis. You can reduce your own greenhouse gas emissions to zero, but if the other countries are not doing the same, it won't help. Similarly, you cannot regulate AI on a national basis. Let's say that uh, one very dangerous development is developing killer robots, autonomous weapon systems. So every country would say, we don't want to do it. We are good guys. But we are afraid that our rivals are doing it. So we have to do it first. If you want to prevent the development and to regulate the development of killer robots, then you can't do it on a one-sided basis of the EU or the UK saying we have a ban on killer robots. Because if the Chinese are doing it and the Americans are doing it, very soon the Europeans will be forced to break their own ban because they don't want to stay behind. So you need more cooperation, not less. Um, Brexit was inspired to some extent, to a large extent, by fears of, of uh, greater immigration. Uh, immigration is a very live issue in, in the European Union and, and obviously elsewhere as well. Mm -hmm. You talk in, in your latest book about, uh, not for the first time, about culturism yes. uh, and about it being different from, from a, a racist perspective, about it perhaps not being a bad thing to, to evaluate cultures mm -hmm. um, hierarchically. Um, does that not give license to people who, who really are just racist 
and who fear um, people unlike them coming into their zone, as, as we see in the EU happening at the moment? Yeah, there is a danger there, of course, that um, the, the difference between racism and culturism, racism is an argument about biology. You say, these people, there is something in their blood, there is something in their genes, there is something in their biology, which inevitably makes them complete the sentence. And this cannot be changed, it's in their biology. Uh, culturism is not about biology. It's saying there is something in their culture. Their culture is less respectful of women. Their culture is more authoritarian. Their culture is whatever. And the thing about arguments on, about, regarding culture is that sometimes, not always, but sometimes they are correct. There are, whereas there is no scientific basis for thinking that there are significant biological differences between people. <clears throat> there are good scientific, there is a good scientific basis for thinking that there are significant differences between cultures. If there are no differences between human cultures, you can close the department of anthropology and the history and so forth because, you know, we are all the same. What's the point of studying the culture of, of, of somebody else? Um, it doesn't mean that every argument about culture is correct. But some of them, yes, there are differences between cultures, and sometimes um, they, they make, it makes good political sense to take these differences into account. Good political sense, but is it thereby legitimate to say sorry or the wrong kind of culture for us? Because that's obviously a pretty dangerous political idea. That's a very dangerous political idea. What we need to remember that as against biology, culture is not uh, immutable. Cultures change, and certainly people change. Even if you were born into a particular culture, it doesn't mean that for the rest of your life you can't change uh, your worldview, your morality, your behavior. Um, within the lifetime of a person, an entire culture can change in a tremendous way. Again, if you think about Germany over the last hundred years, so Germany have undergone so many different cultural changes. The culture of Germany in the time of Hitler and the culture of Germany in the time of Merkel is completely different, and at least some of the people are the same. It's the same people, same DNA, same climate, same geography. So culture is far more mutable. But before you jump to the conclusion, well, these people, they come from that culture, they will never change, so we can't accept them, that, that's going too far. And we're living in a country here, which is home to one of the, the highest profile conflicts mm -hmm. in the world between the Israelis and the Palestinians. As perhaps the, or at least one of the leading Israeli intellectuals, public intellectuals out there, do you feel that you have a duty to address more specifically that conflict and, uh, and what is happening and, and the justice mm. uh, or otherwise of, of either side? Well, I, I have a, a greater duty a per, on a personal level, especially because I live here and I'm a part of, of what's happening in a part of the conflict. Uh, as a scientist, this is not my field of expertise. I'm not an expert on Israeli or in Palestinian politics. I'm not an expert on the Middle East. So I, you know, I have my personal opinions, but I won't put them forward as I try very much not to, to be aware of this confusion that just because I'm an expert on other things, there is a danger that people will take my personal views on this subject as an expert opinion, which, which it is not. So we've been through a few months of uh, very heightened um, uh, clashes in Gaza, uh, threat of potential uh, repeat of what we saw last in, in 2014, mm -hmm. uh, the US embassy moved to, to Jerusalem, uh, the apparent uh, diminution beyond all reasonable hope of a, of a two-state solution. So, again, you know, as, as a leading public thinker here, mm -hmm. how do you view what's, what's been going on the last few months? Oh, it's, uh, it's very bad what is happening. Um, it, I think that the, the key issue is that a tremendous amount of suffering is being caused for millions of people with, with, with no good reason and with no obvious solution in sight. And when you look at even the, the greater picture of what is happening in the Middle East, 
and here I, I, I'll try to speak from my perspective as a global historian, I'll take the global perspective. Um, the entire Middle East is being left behind and with terrible consequences for the people of the Middle East for generations to come. Uh, we are living through a kind of repeat of the Industrial Revolution, but on even grander scale. In the 19th century, the great revolution which changed everything in the world was the Industrial Revolution. A few countries, like Britain, like France, like the US, led this revolution, and they dominated the, the world for the, for the next century or two. Most countries, and certainly most of the countries of the Middle East, they missed the train and therefore they were conquered and exploited and oppressed for two centuries. And one of the main traumas and, and main, main themes that you constantly hear in the Middle East today by Palestinians, by Syrians, by Egyptians, by Iraqis, is this complaint about how the West exploited us and how the West conquered us and, and, and so forth, which all goes back to this basic fact that the Middle East did not industrialize on time. And it's now happening again. And the Middle East is again missing the train. The Chinese have learned the lesson. The Chinese have learned from their national, they had the same national trauma. And China now has kind of a one-pointed mind. We, it's not going to happen to us again. This time, this revolution, the AI revolution, we will lead it. And it will be the West who will be left behind. And you see now that the, like the, the Europeans are terrified that the Chinese are getting ahead of them. But in the Middle East, everybody, almost everybody, are oblivious of that. And they, uh, despite their, uh, their trauma from the Industrial Revolution, they are again missing the train. And this time it's the last train. I mean, with the Industrial Revolution, you still had a chance to catch up. So China managed to catch up. Uh, Turkey, to a large extent, managed to catch up. With this train of, of AI and bioengineering, if you miss this, you will never have another chance because the implications are so huge, this will change humanity itself. And um, what I see now when I look at the greater Middle East is that uh, in, in, it, it's almost hopeless. And they are kind of writing their future a future of subjugation and exploitation and a lot of anger and hatred. But the seeds are planted now and not by America and not by China and not by Japan. It's planted by the people in the Middle East who are not being aware of what is happening on, on, the, on the greater scale of, of history. Uh, let's stay with, with current politics for one, one more question. Um, mm -hmm. We should probably congratu congratulate each other for not yet talking about Donald Trump all this way <laughs> into this interview, but uh, we can't avoid him. Uh, if we he, can try. <laughs> <laughs> if, he, if his rise to the presidency is the result of the kind of forces you've been talking about, you know, a, treat, a retreat towards nationalist, old-fashioned um, tropes mm -hmm. uh, in the face of, of this great change, in the face of... Uh, a, a lack of faith in the in the liberal story. Um, that may be the case, but he has a lot of agency in his role. Yeah. I mean, do you see him, what, whatever collection of neurons and biochemical impulses can mm -hmm. constitute Donald Trump, do you see him, uh, that person, as a potential threat? And, and what kind of, you know, how do you view his his, his actions and the consequences thereof? Well, at present, again, I don't, I'm not an expert on American politics, and I don't understand what's happening inside the USA. But when you look at the bigger picture of the world, what you can say about Donald Trump or what he's doing over the last two years is, is one very big and important thing he's doing, he's destroying the US alliance system all over the world. I don't know why he's doing it, but in a very systematic way, he kind of, He's our, they are our friends, let's destroy that. They are our friends, let's alienate them. He's alienating America's friends in North America, Canada and Mexico, in Western Europe, in the, in the, in the Far East, uh, in South Korea, Japan. He's in a systematic way for reasons I cannot fathom. He's destroying the greatest achievement of, of the US foreign policy for decades and decades to build this alliance, this global alliance system, which was the basis for the world order. And he doesn't seem to have an alternative 
world order to what will fill the, va the vacuum. When I listen to what people like Trump, like uh, 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 the Brexiters, like the leaders now in Italy and, and several other countries, what is their vision? Not of Italy, not of the US, not of Hang Hungary. What will happen to the world? How would the world look like? Um, the other big pressure uh, on, on that front is the ever-expanding economic growth and success of countries that previously have been the, the suppliers of, of labor and materials to the, mm -hmm. to the richer world. And growing middle classes around the world wanting the same kind of lives that those in the West have, have been enjoying in the decades up until now. How does the liberal world order sort of marshal itself to, to deal with that? Because unless you have some oppressive regime saying, no, you can't have that, mm -hmm. then that's going to inevitably happen and put, put greater pressure on, on the resources of the planet? Well, you, it, it, it won't work, and it will be extremely unfair to tell a billion Chinese, well, you can't live like Americans because the planet can't bear it. So we continue to live like Americans, but you can't. That's, that's not a viable option. Uh, what you can do is two things. First of all, develop new eco-friendly technologies. Uh, so you can have two cars, but they cause far less pollution. You can uh, eat meat, but you don't raise cows in order that every Chinese can have a steak for dinner. You just grow a steak from cells, uh, what is known as clean meat, which causes far less ecological problems and far less misery uh, to the cows because there are no cows. Uh, so this is one direction. Uh, invest in new eco-friendly technologies. The other direction is to change our understanding of the good life. Because even if you look at the Americans and, and their affluent society, it doesn't seem that you know, it really is like the commercials on, on television. The, the television promises you paradise, but if you look at the lives of Americans, in many cases it, it, it doesn't really feel like paradise, even if it looks like paradise on TV. So I think we need to recalibrate our understanding of the good life, of the happy life, and uh, to um, release ourselves from the consumerist fantasies, which don't really bring us happiness, but do destroy the planet. Um, let's talk about, about animals for, for a while. I mean, that has been a theme of yours as well over the years. Um, here in Israel, we have a prime minister who likes to make uh, PowerPoint presentations, one of them involving the world's most productive cow. Um, if he was trying to sell it as the world's most miserable cow, which it probably also is, yeah. it might not be quite so <laughs> successful. Um, how urgent do you think the, the issue is in the way that we, we treat animals? Because this, this book, which does address our current moment, doesn't really feature mm -hmm. those arguments as strongly as, as some of your previous work. Um, you've talked about it potentially being the greatest crime ever, the industrialization of, of agriculture and the, the mm -hmm. suffering that it causes. So how much of a duty do we have to address that as well as, the, as, well as our own plight going forward? Oh, we, I think we have a duty towards all sentient beings, both the wild animals which we are driving to extinction and the uh, farm animals, the domesticated animals, which we have enslaved and that now are basically, we treat them as machines for producing milk and eggs and meat for us. And they are probably the most miserable creatures that ever existed. Uh, science now tells us in the clearest way possible that all mammals and birds have a mind, they are conscious, sentient beings, they can feel not just physical pain, they can feel loneliness, they can feel fear, they can be very, very miserable. And our uh, agricultural habits just ignore all that completely. It's just a question of how do you get the most milk out of that cow and how much misery we are inflicting on the cow, nobody cares. And people should, should realize that every glass of milk they drink, it comes at a cost of creating a lot of suffering to, to cows and to calves. Cows never produce milk for people. There is no such thing in nature. You don't see cows producing milk for wolves or for chimpanzees. They don't produce milk for humans either. Cows produce milk for only one reason to feed their young. 
So the entire dairy industry is built on getting the cow pregnant. She gives birth to a calf. Then she produces milk for the calf. But then the humans separate the cow from the calf. Usually they slaughter the cow for, for meat. And then they milk the cow for the milk until it dries up. And you re re do the cycle over and over again. And aside from the terrible physical conditions in which the animals are kept in these cramped, tiny cages, it repeatedly, it, it, the whole industry is based on breaking the most important bond, emotional bond in the mammal kingdom, the bond between mother and offspring. Every glass of milk comes from breaking the bond between a mother and her offspring. And people just don't know it. They go to the supermarket and take a carton of milk, and they don't see the misery that is behind this carton. So, so that's the problem. What's the solution? Is it um, advocating veganism and, and vegetarianism? Is it waiting for technological solutions like the impossible burger, you know, meat mm -hmm. grown, from, grown from cells? How, how does this get solved? And, 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 you know, what should we do? Well, on a, on a personal level, you can make a choice to limit your involvement in the meat and dairy industry. You don't have to go all the way if you just avoid meat even once, once a week, one day a week without meat. It's, it's a good step. It's a, it's a step in the right direction. But realistically, I don't think you can convince the whole of humankind to start avoiding milk and, and, and meat and eggs. And I guess for every, say, Israeli who is now stopping to eat meat and becoming a vegan, there are 10 Chinese who start eating meat. Previously, they didn't have the money uh, to do so. So the real solution, I guess, would come from technology. And what you, you, what you call the impossible burger is not impossible anymore. You can grow meat from cells. You don't need a cow to have a steak. Previously, this was the case. But now you can just grow the, the, the meat from cells. And the first clean meat hamburger, hamburger grown from cells, cost about $300,000. This was five years ago. Now it costs about $10. And uh, we can hope that with proper research and investment in 10 years or 15 years, you can have clean meat, which tastes like just, which is real meat. It's not some plant-based substitute. And which is cheaper, more ecological, and far more ethical than, uh, than slaughtered meat. Um, finally, some of your, your harsher reviewers would um, have said that you are good at diagnosing the trends and the problems, uh, but that you are less um, forthcoming when it, when it comes to proposing solutions <laughs> and answers. I mean, you've tried to inoculate yourself against that by saying that's not really your job, but, mm -hmm. but how do you answer that charge? Well, it's, it's true. It's much harder to uh, find solutions, but it is also very hard to just pinpoint the problems and the questions. Again, to give the, the example of Brexit, the problem with Brexit was not the wrong solution, it was the wrong questions. I mean, when you look at the discussion in the public, people hardly talked about the real problems, about the, the, the real issues. They hardly talked about the enormous role of the European Union in ensuring peace. They didn't talk about wh whether Brexit will help us regulate AI and bioengineering. So the problem was this, that they were distracted from the main questions. So I see my main job at present in just bringing clarity by making people focus on the most important problems. Then comes the issue, OK, so what are the solutions? And actually, in many cases, we do know what the solutions are. It's just difficult to implement them, especially without global cooperation. And with climate change, uh, we do know what are the solutions. It's no longer a big mystery. We know what kind of technologies we need to develop. And we can do it. We know what kind of environmental regulations we need to enforce, and we can do it. But the problem is there is no political will. So, and, and with, with AI and bioengineering, it's, it's far more complicated uh, because nobody knows where it's going and nobody knows what, uh, uh, what kind of possibilities are opening before us. But even here, there are many things we can do. The problem is the lack of political will and even more the lack of attention. 
If people focus on these issues, I don't think the solutions are, are so difficult. Yuval Harari, thank you very much for talking to Al Jazeera. Thank you. It was my pleasure.